Buenos días. Es un gusto para mí participar en este primer encuentro científico organizado por la Universidad Francisco Marroquín. Agradezco los, a los organizadores y desde ya les pido disculpas por hacer la presentación en inglés, pero como muchos de ustedes se pueden imaginar, después de haber hecho trabajo en Estados Unidos durante tanto tiempo, es mucho más fácil mi, la comunicación de mis pensamientos científicos in English. Today I'm going to talk to you about alcohol and HIV and how they interact with antiretrovirals, increasing the risk of comorbidities in persons infected with HIV. And the main themes of the presentation will include an introduction to alcohol and HIV epidemiology, I'll share with you some of the main findings from our simian immunodeficiency virus infected non-human primate model. And I will give you insight into the translational approach and integration that we have uh, been doing over the past 10 years. Alcohol is the most frequently used and abused legal drug that can permeate to virtually all tissues in the body result in significant multi-systemic pathophysiological consequences. Alcohol is the third leading lifestyle related cause of death in the United States through its contribution to several comorbidities, including diabetes mellitus, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, dysrhythmias, stroke, and pneumonia. However, recognition of alcohol as an underlying causal factor in comorbid conditions remains a challenge in the clinical setting. Many patients do not get asked about their alcohol use and measuring the amount and frequency of alcohol consumption is challenging. Persons living with HIV have two to three greater lifetime prevalence of alcohol use disorders than the general population and approximately 10% are heavy drinkers. With the advent of antiretroviral therapy, HIV infection has now become a chronic disease, and their extended survival and associated aging has led to an increase in geriatric syndromes. Moreover, increased survival leads to a greater risk for other factors to impact on disease progression, factors like alcohol and drug use, which are common in the HIV-infected population. The study of the impact of drugs of abuse and alcohol on disease progression in a clinical setting is obscured by multiple factors, including the use of more than one drug, the identification of patients matched by disease state, the use of antiretrovirals, and the limitations in tissue and blood sampling from these individuals. So significant amount of knowledge is derived from the integration of cellular and animal studies and interpreted considering what we know of human disease progression. Our group has used a non-human primate model of simian immunodeficiency virus infection, or SIV, and adapted it to study the impact of what we term chronic binge alcohol consumption, which will, you will see abbreviated as CBA, because animals will not voluntarily consume high amounts of alcohol. Animals are fitted with an intragastric catheter that is used for chronic administration of alcohol at an average of 13 to 14 grams of ethanol per kilogram of body weight per week. This amount of alcohol produces intoxicating levels of alcohol, averaging 50 millimolar at two hours into the infusion. In our model, alcohol is administered for three months prior to the inoculation with SIV, which we have done either intravenously, intrarectally, or intravaginally. Over the years, we have conducted studies initially exclusively in males and more recently in female macaques. We have followed animals with and without antiretroviral therapy treatment to get at how alcohol impacts on disease progression with and without adherence to ART. This model allows us to study the animals during the asymptomatic phase as well as during the end stage of disease. It allows us to study the animals with or without the use of antiretroviral therapy. And it allows us to use 
a series of techniques, including anthropometrics, imaging such as DEXA scan, biochemical measures using metabolic cages to collect 24-hour urine, and serial biopsies of lymph nodes of the gut mucosa or of skeletal muscle. And if we look at the results from our studies collectively, what the studies from the LSU Comprehensive Alcohol Research Center show is that alcohol interacts with SIV pathogenesis through three main domains. It alters mucosal immunity, and this is particularly true for the gastrointestinal mucosa, producing an early gut immunopathogenesis. It increases infectivity and viral replication, shown in the figure, the fact that at the first intrarectal inoculation of animals, 100% of the animals that received alcohol were immediately infected with SIV. However, the animals that were receiving a vehicle control, only 60% of them got infected, and we had to inoculate them sometimes twice or even three times before they would get infected. But perhaps the most striking is the increase in mortality in non-ART treated animals, shown in this graph, where the red line indicates the median time to end stage in alcohol treated animals, which is much shorter than the median time to end stage in the vehicle treated animals. And so using these three main findings, we have crafted a working model in which binge alcohol consumption in the infected host leads to an increase in viral replication, lymphocyte turnover, dysbiosis, and gut barrier leak, resulting in the translocation of toxins and bacterial products into the systemic circulation. This promotes chronic immune activation, leading to a state of immune exhaustion and senescence and chronic inflammation that contributes to tissue injury and development of comorbidities. This gut immunopathogenesis driven by the increased immune cell activation and cytotoxic T cell activation allows the translocation of toxins into the systemic circulation. So overall, this state of chronic subclinical inflammation leads to an increase in risk for comorbidities. Colleagues within our group are also interested in investigating how the physical and the social neighborhood and interpersonal environment impacts on the risk for development of comorbidities and how it also impacts on behaviors such as alcohol use, diet, smoking, physical activity, and antiretroviral therapy adherence. In the interest of time, I will not share data collected from this arm of the study with you today. And so you might be wondering, how can it be possible that um, this can be modeled or studied? So this theoretical model has been used to design four research components within the Comprehensive Alcohol Research Center that allow us to look at the community interpersonal stress, that allow us to look at the metabolic dysregulation in persons living with HIV and the mechanisms underlying risk for comorbidities. And this is the component that I lead. It allows us to examine the neurological consequences of alcohol and a Western diet in the context of HIV. And it allows us to study how alcohol, immune activation and senescence impact on activation induced cell death. To do this, we combine the benefit of having access to information from the community, we study the clinical cohort, and whenever there's a question that needs mechanistic studies, we bring it back to the non-human primate. So we have what we call a bi-directional translational approach where we can go from persons living with HIV to the non-human primate, back to persons living with HIV. And in doing so, we integrate clinicians with basic scientists in crafting and in addressing the scientific questions that we pose. Our clinical study, also known as the NOAA study for New Orleans Alcohol and HIV study, allows us to do that translational approach. 
currently we have over 365 persons living with HIV. 40% of them have an audit score and audit stands for alcohol use disorder inventory test, greater or equal to eight. Most of them are male. Most of them are African-American. Most of them are relatively well controlled with only 13% of our subjects having a CD4 count under 200. And with 70% of our subjects having viral loads under 20. We use a comprehensive approach to assess alcohol exposure and use by persons living with HIV AIDS. So we can track all the way from the lifetime alcohol use, the past year, past month, environmental exposure to alcohol outlet density. And we also collect a biomarker reflecting recent use. And this biomarker is phosphatidylethanol. And for those of you who are familiar with endocrine, um, markers. It is reminiscent of glycosylated hemoglobin because what this tells you is how the red blood cell membrane has been altered by the exposure to alcohol during the recent two to three months. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was to be able to demonstrate that what we had seen in the non-human primate actually happened in the clinical setting. And so what I'm showing you here is that soluble CD14 levels and soluble CD14 is a core receptor for lipopolysaccharide, LPS. So the higher the levels of soluble CD14, the greater the amount the system is exposed to lipopolysaccharide, that gram negative bacterial um, part that we believe is coming from the gut. And this is shown to be increased in the monkeys after three months of alcohol exposure and to also be increased at viral set point. When we look at the clinical setting, we see that both timeline follow back as well as PET, the biomarker for alcohol use, are associated positively with IFAP, which is intestinal fatty acid binding protein, and it reflects epithelial injury as well as with ATA, A1AT, which is a fecal to plasma alpha-1 antitrypsin ratio that reflects gut leak. So our prediction that there's a decrease in gut barrier integrity has been now confirmed in the clinical setting. We also predicted that this leak would lead to an increase in immune activation, immune exhaustion, and senescence, and indeed, in our clinical cohort audit, lifetime alcohol exposure, and the biomarker PETH are positively associated with exhausted CD8 T, cell, T cells with um, exhausted and activated CD8 T cells as well. And if we look at the lifetime alcohol exposure, we see that it positively correlates with the increased risk for frailty. And the way that we measured frailty was by looking at the phenotypic frailty index that looks at shrinking, weakness, poor endurance, energy, and slowness of movement. And what we were able to demonstrate is that the higher the rank lifetime alcohol exposure, the greater the risk for frailty was in our individuals. And so we have been now focused on two particular comorbidities that make part of that frailty syndrome, cognitive impairment and metabolic dysregulation. In our early studies demonstrated that the number of errors that the monkeys performed it had when they were acquiring or performing a behavioral task was much higher in the alcohol SIV treated animals than in the SIV infected alone or in the alcohol treated animals alone. So think of percentage of errors when you're learning a task and percentage of errors when you're performing the task. Subsequent studies showed that SIV increased inflammatory gene markers in the frontal cortex and in the basal ganglia and attenuated growth factor signaling in the frontal cortex and in the basal ganglia. And while antiretroviral therapy corrected the inflammatory changes, 
it did not alter the um, defects in growth factor signaling really suggesting that impairment and growth factor signaling might actually be one of the reasons that cognitive dysfunction still prevails despite adequate control of viral load. And this is now being followed up in both in the monkey and in the clinical setting. And what I'm showing you is data reflecting impaired cognition in the alcohol SIV non-human primates. And this is reflected by a decrease in the time spent manipulating a novel object. So when an animal is given a novel object, normally they want to explore. They want to get to know that novel object better. But the infected animals treated with alcohol show decrease in novel object recognition. When we take this to the clinical setting, we use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, or MOCA. And what we see in this cohort of 126 individuals is that HIV infected individuals with a low audit score have much lower MOCA test scores as compared to controls depicted by the dotted line. And this is further decrease in those individuals that have high or at risk alcohol consumption. But if we think of frailty, we believe that at the heart of frailty is skeletal muscle mass and the loss of skeletal muscle mass that leads to a decrease in resting uh, metabolic rate, decreased activity, decreased walking speed is central to the phenotype of aging processes. And one of the very early findings from my laboratory was demonstrating that body mass index at end stage SIV infection in the alcohol treated animals was significantly lower than the vehicle treated animals. And when we looked at thigh muscle area, we saw that this decreased muscle at body mass index was due to a decrease in muscle uh, area. So this was the first finding that alerted us to investigate skeletal muscle. Since then, a cohort of studies have demonstrated that in skeletal muscle, there is an increase in inflammation, oxidative stress, profibrotic environment, and a decrease in stem cell regeneration potential. In addition, in the whole body, we see a decrease in insulin response to glucose, a decreased disposition index, insulin signaling, and levels of, a, of adiponectin. What is interesting is that all of these changes are occurring before the animals show a change in fasting glycemia and despite receiving a controlled normal diet. We have looked further and shown that alcohol or chronic binge alcohol changes skeletal muscle mitochondrial gene expression genes that are critical for oxidative stress, for apoptosis-related signaling, and for mitophagy, as well as for mitochondrial biogenesis. And that these changes in gene expression are associated with a decrease in the maximal oxygen consumption rate that conversely is associated with an increase in glycolytic capacity. So basically what it's telling us is that alcohol is changing the way that the cell is metabolizing energy. Similar findings have been um, discovered in the skeletal muscle gene expression of persons living with HIV with dysglycemia and at risk alcohol use. And what is interesting is that as the log for the audit score multiplied by the two hour glucose level from an oral glucose tolerance test is measured, the volume of mitochondria appears to increase, linking mitochondrial volume to metabolic dysregulation. But more recently, we've asked the question about cells of the immune system. So we all think of HIV as a disease that affects the immune system. So we've asked whether alcohol alters metabolism in cells of the immune system, and could that contribute to disease pathogenesis? And interestingly, what we find is what appears to be a mitohermetic response by alcohol in which the cells of the immune system try to compensate by increasing mitofusin, SOD, NRF2, which are critical um, 
genes that code for proteins that protect from oxidative stress. And what was surprising is that the cells, the immune cells of the alcohol treated animals actually had higher plasma viral load as well as um, increased viral replication. So this is now asking the question of whether mitohormesis is driving viral replication or whether viral replication is driving mitohormesis, bringing us back to the chicken and the egg. We've asked whether altered skeletal muscle functional phenotype is the only contributor to alcohol-associated metabolic instability in HIV and SIV. And what our data indicate is that at-risk alcohol use in persons living with HIV impairs pancreatic endocrine function, as shown by a diminishing HOMA-beta index, basically showing decrease insulin release in response to a glucose load. And this is also illustrated on the right-hand side where we look at two-hour oral glucose tolerance test levels in individuals with a low audit score versus those with a high audit score. Two things are important here. These individuals were not classified as diabetics. So normally they would not have had an oral glucose tolerance test done. But when you look at the data, you can see that Almost 35% of HIV positive individuals with an alcohol use that is at risk or heavy alcohol use have impaired glucose tolerance test. We've gone back now to the monkey to try to understand what could be going on at the level of the pancreas that impairs insulin release. And what we see is a decrease in the relative gene expression of components that are critical for insulin secretion, including the ATP potassium channel, the docking proteins, BAMP2 and syntaxin that are the ones that are critical for that insulin containing vesicle to dock in the membrane and release insulin into the circulation. We've also seen that in adipose tissue, alcohol alters the adipose tissue structure creating smaller cells and more fibrotic tissue, but also increases the inflammatory milieu as seen by the increase in mast cell recruitment to adipose tissue. We believe that this pro-fibrotic environment has multiple impacts. Two of them are currently under investigation. The first one is a decrease in adipocyte-derived stem cell differentiation. And the other one is a decrease in adiponectin release. And that is the work that John Quill Pere, one of the uh, grad students in my lab, is working on. So metabolic instability um, by alcohol, SIV and ART, is mediated by multiple different organs, including changes in gluconeogenic and lipogenic capacity, particularly associated with antiretroviral therapy at the level of the liver. So what can we do about this? We have a new study that is looking at whether aerobic exercise for a three, three days um, a week for a 10 week period can actually improve metabolic homeostasis. And so those data will be exciting to look at. We've looked at epigenetic mechanisms and find that there are multiple epigenetic mechanisms that are affecting myoblast satellite cell differentiation and the formation of a functional muscle fiber, particularly MIR-206, which is significantly decreased in the alcohol SIV skeletal muscle and myoblast has been linked to an impairment in um, skeletal muscle stem cell differentiation. We are now exploring the possibility that these mirrors could actually be used non-invasively to assess skeletal muscle functional state in the clinical setting and are currently asking what I think is a quite a difficult question to answer is whether interorgan communication mediates these pathophysiological changes. So is there something that adipose tissue is releasing that is talking to skeletal muscle or to the pancreas that produces the alterations in metabolic stability? But one of the 
beauties of having this bi-directional translational approach is that we can then take findings from the clinical setting and go back and try to answer them in the non-human primate. And one of the findings from last year was that the diet that persons living with HIV was consuming was significantly be below the US average. And we all know that um, US average is bad enough, but these patients are consuming even more carbohydrates and more total fat. So we've now gone back to modify the diet that the monkeys are consuming to what we now call a Western diet, which is high in sucrose, high in fat. And as expected, we see an increase in triglycerides three months into the diet, which appears to even be higher in the alcohol-treated animals. And this is accompanied by an increase in insulin resistance in the Western diet fed animals. But what was unexpected was the finding that plasma viral load at set point appears to be higher in the animals that are fed the Western diet. And that when we look at the responsiveness of these animals to antiretroviral therapy, those animals that are receiving a vehicle show effective suppression in viral load, but the animals that are receiving alcohol do not show the same effectiveness in viral load suppression when they receive antiretroviral therapy. And this is coupled with greater number of infected cells in the lymph nodes and in the spleen, and with a greater percentage of um, actively replicating cells in the spleen and in the lymph nodes as compared to the vehicle treated animals. So I hope to have shared with you our ability of taking environmental factors, how they impact on behavior, looking at behaviors, including alcohol use, smoking, physical activity, and how they impact on comorbidities and the interaction within an alcohol using person living with HIV. I hope to also have shared with you the ability of going from the basic science from the bench to the clinical setting to incorporate the environment and then to bring it back to the non-human primate model for uh, mechanistic studies. I am only presenting the work of multiple different individuals, particularly trainees and colleagues that have contributed to um, this study. And I would be more than happy to take questions from the audience. Thank you. ¿Cuál es la principal preocupación para el manejo del paciente con VIH y el abuso de alcohol? La primera preocupación es por lo menos identificar que sí existe un problema de abuso de al, del alcohol. Muchas veces, y eso lo sabemos basado en encuestas que hemos hecho con los médicos tratantes acá, es, son preguntas que no se le hacen al paciente. Entonces, lo primero es identificar si hay uso de alcohol, identificar cuáles son las eh, el nivel de abuso y tratar de ver si se puede disminuir Eh, eliminar siempre es mucho más difícil, pero tratar de ver si se puede disminuir el uso del alcohol y reenforzar la idea que aún cuando una persona está tomando la, el, las drogas, los antirretrovirales, siguen siendo efectivos. Una de las cosas que hemos encontrado acá es que los pacientes tienen el concepto de que si están tomando o si van a parrandear o si van a salir a tomar ese fin de semana, Eh, se saltean uno o dos días de antirretrovirales y eso es mucho más dañino que seguírselos tomando aún y cuando están eh, consumiendo alcohol. Y obviamente, eh, si es un problema severo, encontrar mecanismos de eh, controlar el uso del alcohol eh, con diferentes eh, mecanismos, psiquiatría, psicología, eh, con eh, trabajadoras sociales que pueden ayudar al paciente a manejar el problema. ¿Cómo tiene que sufrir el individuo de abuso de alcohol para observar los efectos descritos en su presentación? Repítame la primera parte que no le escuché bien. ¿Cuánto tiempo tiene que sufrir el individuo de abuso de alcohol para observar los efectos descritos en su presentación? Muy buena pregunta. Y lo que nosotros estamos viendo es 
muchas veces es el uso cumulativo, o sea, años de uso de alcohol. Muchos de los pacientes que estamos eh, estudiando empezaron a usar alcohol a los 10, 12, 13 años, aumentaron bastante el consumo alrededor de los 20, 30 años y aún y cuando han disminuido el consumo del alcohol eh, a, la, a la etapa actual, es el, lo que llamamos el rank lifetime alcohol use, o sea, el, el uso cumulativo, no solamente en tiempo, sino que en cantidad, sobre te, durante los años antes de estar infectados, y muchos de ellos siguen usándolo durante el tiempo de que, han, que están ya diagnosticados y en tratamiento. Con eso concluimos con las preguntas. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Cruz, por conectarse.